Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei Joined the Phoenix Family. Part 1. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Scene, Kuo train station, she should have been here by now. I wonder what's taking her. Issei Haidu was standing near a large bulletin board outside of the station. He was dressed in a grey and black shirt with red trim. His warm and brown eyes had a sense of anxiety behind them. Here, you should take this flyer. A strangely dressed woman interrupted Issei's worry. She had brown hair down to her shoulders in a very strange style, which gave the impression of two wings on each side of her head. The outfit was costume-like, almost cosplay. She held in her right arm a pink plastic bag, presumably full of whatever she was handing to our protagonist. Right after handing the teen this odd-looking flyer, she simply giggled and walked away. Oh goody, I wonder what this is about. Issei was staring at the white card which had roses adorned on the corners, as well as a naked redeated lady on the top right. In the center of this paper was a circle written in black. It had complex runes and symbols on it. Issei thought it looked kind of cool. Oh, it says, your wish will be granted. Ha, as if that could be true. Issei was about to toss the flyer into the garbage, that was until the teen heard his name being called. Issei. Hey. A black-haired girl with pink-colored eyes came jogging from across the street. She was very pretty. Not too tall, but she had a cute figure for her size. Her voice was also very cute. Issei was jumping for joy deep down. Oh, hey, you made it. Cool. Sorry to keep you waiting. The black-haired girl bowed apologetically. Oh, I'm just glad you came. Issei then celebrated within his own mind. I've always wanted to say that to a chick. As the two stepped onto a bus leading toward the shopping district of Kuo, two very beautiful high school girls could be seen, watching from a distance as they were closer toward the station. One of the girls had black hair with a bob cut. The petite female was sporting a pair of maroon glasses which intensified her violet eye color. Standing next to her was the second girl. She was much taller with long locks of crimson colored hair. Her eyes were the color of the sky, while her body was that of a supermodel. Both girls were wearing Kuo school girl uniforms and looked to be concealing themselves from the couple that just boarded the bus. A shorter girl spoke up while adjusting her glasses. Ria's, that's a fallen, no doubt about it. I told you it was a good idea that we followed him. Also, great job with your familiar. As long as he keeps that pamphlet, you can track him. The now known Ria's blinks her blue eyes a few times and then replies. You know, we could have just left him with the flyer. I mean, we don't have to follow him all around town. How about we go to the public baths and just wait for a while? Ria's. Sona is pinching the bridge of her nose in frustration. But, Sona, the Gremory seal will activate the moment he either calls for me or if his life is in danger. As long as he has it, he's safe as houses. Ria's has her index finger into the air as she explains her reasoning. And what if she just kills him right then and there? What if he doesn't have the chance to call for you or rather, the time it takes for the seal to activate? Sona is grinding her teeth at Ria's carefree attitude. Oh, well, I could always resurrect him, easy PC. Ria shows a goofy smile. Sona then takes a deep breath as she releases the bridge of her nose. Ria's, what about his body? Did you think about that? What if that fallen thing destroys his body? Ria's tilts her head while occasionally blinking. Ooh oh. Sona face palms once again. Ria's. You can be such a baka sometimes. Alright, let's get going, the bus is headed toward the shopping district. Let's go over here and I'll make a circle. Scene, Kuo shopping district. So, where would you like to go first, Yuma? If you're hungry, we can always get some cha first. Um, he, there's the arcade, Rikariak, oh yeah, there is this really chill cafe that has amazing drinks. Oh um, yeah, he, I'll shut up now. Issei looked embarrassed as he was scratching the back of his head. Oh, Issei, relax a bit. It's not like I am going to hurt you or anything, haha. Ha. How about we get some food first? Afterwards, we can just play it by ear. What do you say? Yuma was smiling brightly while looking around at the different businesses and restaurants. Oh, yeah, okay. Issei nodded as the two walked across the street. Meanwhile, Sona and Ria's were staying hidden behind a street raiment stand. Both girls were watching Yuma and Issei walk toward a burger joint. You know, I've had to deal with Haidu a multitude of times in regards to detention. I can't even remember how many times it's been now. It's usually him, along with those other two perverts, Mitsuda and Motohama, who are always getting themselves into lecherous situations. But this is strange. Sona was adjusting her glasses again while focusing on Issei from a distance. Ria smiles as if she is about to laugh. Wow, so he has quite the reputation with you as well as what the other students say. Considering Issei's perverted nature, it makes me wonder what type of sacred gear is hidden within him. Sona shakes her head. To finish what I was saying earlier, it's strange that Haidu isn't staring at this girl's chest. Rather, he is keeping eye contact with her. 
That indeed is odd. Also, who cares about his gear at the moment? His life, the life of a human, under our jurisdiction, could be ended at any moment by that hussy fallen angel. Bria's nods while continuing to smile. Well, I was just curious, that's all. You should take that fallen's advice and relax a bit. Sona just looks back at Ria's with a blank look. You know, Ria's. It's true that you're my best friend, but sometimes I have to question, how is it that you are in charge of anything? Ria's tilts her head while looking confused. Um, what? Before Sona can respond, as she is now face palming, a red hologram of a woman with long black hair tied into a ponytail extends from Ria's palm. The president is playing dumb, Sitri Sama. I surmise that Haidu Issei has never had the chance to go on a date before, and because of this, he is leaving nothing to chance. The long black haired woman then politely bows while smirking at Ria's. Sona looks over toward both Ria's and the hologram of who she knows as Akeno Himajima. Your information is solid. Issei, Urm, Haidu has never been on a date before now. Really? Ria's and Akeno both gain slightly malicious grins. Ria's then replies. Oh, yeah, this Issei Haidu kid is quite the hopeless case. That's just too bad I suppose. Ria shrugs. Sona gets lost in thought. It's not like he isn't attractive or anything, not to mention, he's already in high school. How is it that he hasn't been with a girl before? Considering how he acts along with that perverted duo, I would have at least figured Haidu had some experience. Wait a minute. A defensive mechanism perhaps. Sona continues to stare off into the distance and toward a window where Issei and Yuma were sitting at the burger restaurant. It's true, even now, he continues to act like a perfect gentleman. Even when the girl isn't looking, he still doesn't take the opportunity to stare. Issei Haidu, is there more to you? Scene, 45 minutes later, Kuo Park. Wow, thank you so much for this, Issei. Does it look cute on me? Yuma was now showing off a purple-colored scrunchie while smiling warmly. I think it looks great as a bracelet, just like this. Placing the gift around her arm as if it were a bracelet, Yuma made a few poses while winking. Totally, yeah, it looks amazing on you, Yuma. I'm really glad you like it. To be honest, I've been really nervous during our date, and I still am. I'm sorry. Issei was now smiling nervously. Yuma tilted her head while focusing on Issei's expression and body language. Well then, it is what it is. Say, can I ask you a question? Issei nodded. If we were alone with me in your house, right now, what would you do? Yuma was now slightly grinning while waiting for an answer that she was expecting. Issei thought for a moment and then smiled. Well, I'd say we would need to stock up on snacks and drinks so we could pull a movie marathon with some kind of theme to it. Maybe horror movies, the cheesy ones, stuff we can comment on. I think it's a good way to be entertained and still interact while talking trash about how bad the movies are. Yuma almost tripped over her own feet after hearing Issei's comment. Sona and Ria's were sitting behind a large hedge while peeping over the plant. Ria's then turned toward Sona with a questioning glance. The SST, I thought you and Akeno both said the Haidu kid was a sexual deviant. Ria's looked very confused. Sona thought for a moment and then replied. Just be quiet and keep your eyes on them. The park is quiet at this time of night, which means that Fallen can strike at any time. Sona also had questions regarding Issei. Ria's has a point. Issei has not been acting like his lecherous self at all during this date. Maybe I am onto something regarding Issei using perversion as a type of defense. Curious and curiouser. Yuma was now looking at her water bottle and then back at a nervously smiling Issei. A thought came to mind. Smirking, the pink-eyed teen proceeded to accidentally spill water all over her chest. Nuo? Yuma was covering her front while acting ashamed, thinking that the male teenager would be goggling over her wet shirt, trying to see the girl's breasts, to her surprise, Yuma instead was handed the shirt from Issei's back. I just put it on before I left for the station so it's pretty clean. Issei was now taking a few steps back while only showing his front side. Sona and Ria's jaws both dropped at Issei's actions. Oh wow, that's very dashing of him. That is so romantic. Ria's was now blushing with both of her hands on her cheeks. I'll say Sona was adjusting her glasses while doing her best to hide her own blush. Yuma now had Issei's shirt in her hands while showing a very confused look. Um, okay then. Issei simply nodded. Well, it's getting pretty late. Did you want me to walk with you back to the station or are you meeting up with somebody later? Yuma sees that Issei is backing up slowly while facing her. Issei, is there something wrong with your back? The way you are acting, it's like you don't want me to see. Shaking his head, Issei smiles softly. It's just some ugly scars I got from when I was a kid. Yuma then takes a good look around the park, noticing only a fountain nearby. She then looks back at Issei. Attempting a warm smile of her own, though she really wants to grin, Yuma points toward the fountain. How about we go sit over there for just a bit longer? Yuma continued to smile. As the two walked closer toward the fountain, Yuma was able to see what Issei was hiding on his back. 
The scars looked almost like two small hands near the upper shoulders, followed up with two large scars toward the bottom sides near his ribcage. Oh, wow, Issei, you're right, those scars are pretty gnarly. Yuma wrapped Issei's shirt around her chest and shoulders as she sat down near the fountain. Trying to make light of the situation, Issei forced himself to giggle. Haha, ha, yeah, sorry about that. He then sat next to Yuma while looking off into the distance. Hey, Issei, can I ask you a question? Yuma was now smirking again. Sure, what's up? Issei turned his attention toward Yuma and was surprised she was grinning back at him. To commemorate our first date, would you die for me? Her pink eyes widened as her grin became even wider. Wait, what? Issei stood from the fountain while showing an expression of both confusion and slight terror. Is this chick some kind of serial killer or something? Who asks that kind of question? And that look she is giving me, it's so disturbing. Yuma stood while continuing to grin. Instantly a pair of very large black wings erupt from the back of the pink-eyed raven-haired girl. At the same time, her clothes look to have been disintegrated and replaced by a very revealing S&M style suit, accompanied with a single piece of spiked shoulder armor. As Issei continued to back up, he tripped and fell down onto his butt. Yuma was now taller, older and much more developed, and she continued with her grin. Standing on top of the water fountain, Yuma pointed toward the fallen Issei as her grin became so wide, you could see sharp and shark-like teeth behind her curled lips. Ahahaha. <laughs> well, I wish I could say that this has all been fun, but it wasn't. I was really hoping that you were going to be just like what the files said about you. Perverted and lustful. Heck, well, I guess I'm not getting laid tonight, oh well. But maybe, just maybe you can still provide me with some entertainment. Yuma extended her wings to maximum as her grin remained. Issei, not liking where this was going, didn't have time to ask questions about this thing that could only be the stuff of nightmares. Instead, he got to his feet and began to run as fast as he could in the opposite direction as the winged monster. Oh, that's cute, you wanna run now? Well then, let's take care of that, shall we? Yuma lifted one of her arms and produced a red and jagged looking weapon made from light. Gaining a small blush, Yuma tossed this energetic thing toward the running teen. It instantly hit its target, which was Issei's left and upper leg. Ah. Issei fell back onto the ground while holding onto his leg with both hands. Seeing this crimson and glowing thing inside of his leg, the teen couldn't help but scream even louder. Ah. Riaz and Sona stood from behind the bushes. Scene, Kuo Park, how about I give you a matching set? It's not fair for your other leg, don't you think? Yuma was grinning and blushing like never before as another red spear of light manifested into her palm. Issei was in a great deal of physical and emotional pain. Aahhh. Yuma why are you doing this to me? Goddamn, it hurts. Laughing maniacally, the winged monster known as Yuma replies. Rainer, it's Rainer, you lowly monkey. Ha 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 ha. The now known Rainer tosses her second spear toward Issei's other leg. Issei flinches and closes his eyes only to hear the sounds of a small explosion. Opening his eyes, a female, wearing the short skirt of Kuo Academy, was standing in front of him with her arms held outward. That very long and black hair, cut at the ends in a Japanese style, this was none other than Tsubaki Shinra. Unknown to Issei, in front of the girl was a floating mirror that was hovering near the generous bosom of Tsubaki. It happened very quickly. As Rainer released her crimson spear of light, Tsubaki arrived in a split second, standing directly in front of Issei, only to catch the said spear within her floating mirror. Rainer looked puzzled as her grin disappeared. What in the absolute fuck? The black-winged creature had her sharp canines exposed as she showed a very angry sneer. As quickly as her sentence had ended, Rainer's eyes widened to extreme proportions as Tsubaki's mirror released the crimson spear it had been holding on to. Before she had realized it, her own weapon was now impaled into her own stomach. The HHLLRR Rainer fell from the fountain top and into the water. The color of crimson began to change the water's natural blue. After the failed flutter of those crow-like wings, all went still. The monster was dead. Nodding to herself, Tsubaki turned around only to see a hysterically crying Issei. Jumping from the bushes behind Issei were both Sona Citri and Ria's Gremory, as Ria's was brushing herself off. Meanwhile Sona dashed at maximum speed and bent down near a disheveled Issei. Trying to reach over toward the teen's wound, Issei flinched and scooted back in fear. President Shatori, Vice President Tsubaki. No, this isn't right. This is a dream, yeah, a bad fucking dream. Issei grabbed hold of his head with both hands and shook from right to left. I do. Sona spoke in a very direct and no-nonsense way. Snapping out of it, Issei, still holding onto his head, looked directly back towards Sona with a very dead stare in his eyes. Good, alright then. I am going to come over to you, just stay calm. Sona scooted closer toward Issei as she wanted to inspect his wound. Tsubaki just watched the scene play out. Ria's was also watching with a bit of intrigue. Not moving, Issei allowed Sona to look over his bleeding leg. 
The red spear had disappeared the moment Raynor was killed, however the wound was now open and bleeding profusely. Tsubaki, create a circle, we are taking him back to the council office. Sona was ripping her skirt into a large strip of fabric. Noticing that Issei was now just looking up into the night sky with a look that one could only describe as catatonic, Sona wrapped the fabric around the teen's wound. Haidu, this is going to hurt. Sona waited for a response and got none, so she tightened the bandage. Issei's eyes rolled to the back of his head. Ugh. Ria's, for the first time involving this boy, started to feel concerned. She could see the scars on his back. They were fire burns, deep ones too. What happened to you, Issei Haidu? Sona also noticed the scars but focused on the task at hand. Such questions could always be asked later. I'm sorry about that. Can you stand? Issei nodded and attempted only to fall back down while grunting in pain. Just stay there, we will Sona was cut off the moment Tsubaki reached down and put one of Issei's arms over her shoulders. Um, thank you Tsubaki. Don't mention it, President. Alright, Haidu, one, two and three. Tsubaki got the teen to his feet and slowly walked toward the blue and glowing circle that she created. The group of four all stepped into the center of this amalgamation of blue light. Within an instant, a nearly blinding blue flash was all that could be seen. Scene, Kuo Academy, Student Council Office, Blue Flash. Toward the center of the fairly large room were now Issei, hunched over against Tsubaki, along with Sona and Riaz. Lay him on that couch over there, Riaz, go to the orc and grab the med kit. Grabbing one of the comfy chairs, Sona moved it over toward the couch where Issei now lay. Riaz nodded and made a quick stride out of the room. Tsubaki cleared her throat as she stood over the couch. President, I will prepare some coconut water. It's good for dehydration as Haidu will need it. Sona nodded while looking at a very quiet Issei, who was staring up at the ceiling as he laid on his back. Blood was seeping from the makeshift bandage that Sona prepared. Feeling wet around his midsection, Issei looked down only to see the color of red. Red, no, more like crimson, almost the same color as that Ria's girl's hair. Deciding that looking at his own blood was doing little good, Issei laid his head back and stared back toward the ceiling. Um, Sona. The teen spoke in a quiet and parched voice. With a stoic expression, Sona nods. Yes, I do. Did that thing hit an artery? I'm not a doctor nor do I pretend to know shit about anatomy, but that's a lot of blood. Issei began to shake a bit, either due to fear or blood loss. I am not sure, to be honest. Riaz is bringing back a med kit from, well, it doesn't matter right now. But I do know it has bandages and everything else we should need. So please, just calm down. Sona then looked toward the main door, trying to listen for footsteps. Not feeling disappointed, Riaz came barging through the door with a large red box in her arms. The redeed had a victorious smile as she placed said box down beside Sona and Issei. You know, this stuff is meant for, well, us. And ex Sona, that's a lot of blood. Riaz jumped back with surprise. Ignoring her best friend, Sona was rummaging through the red container in a desperate manner. Meanwhile, Issei's blood, gathered by the large couch, began to leak its contents onto the carpeted floor. At the same time, the teen's eyes began to slowly close. Riaz noticed Issei drifting away and screamed. Sona. Throwing the box across the room in frustration, Sona looked over toward Riaz in an angry manner. What? Riaz pointed toward Issei while frowning. Turning her head the other way, Sona's jaw dropped. Both girls were now trying to shake the unresponsive teen. Sona placed her hand under his nostrils to feel for air. He wasn't breathing. Riaz laid her head on Issei's chest and then shook her head shortly after. Sona's eyes widened to the extreme. Instantly, both girls stood up. Riaz ran out of the room as fast as she could. Sona meanwhile, ran to her desk and searched the drawers frantically. Taking a deep breath, Sona found what she was looking for. Running back toward the blood socked couch, Sona sat back down at her seat while opening a small and jeweled blue box. Looking through this container, Sona pulled out a handful of what looked like pawn pieces from a chess game. Eight blue glowing pawn pieces were in both of Sona's hands. She listened for footsteps and heard nothing. Looking back at the lifeless body of Issei Haidu, a few memories flashed in Sona's mind. Haidu is back once again. What did he do this time? Oh, him and his two friends were caught, peeping in the kendo girl's locker room. What's that make it now? At least a dozen times. Why won't he learn to stop spotting for those morons? It's true, he was only the lookout in all of this, Tsubaki informed me, but still. Whatever. Maybe he has homework he needs help with. Well, for the good of this school's reputation, I am sure I can at least salvage Haidu Issei from the perversion that is Mitsuda and Motohama. Oh, then there is that Ikakiryu girl. I didn't think females could be just as bad as males when it came to all-out lewd behavior. Oh, he does have homework. Wait, why is that making me happy? Shaking her head momentarily, Sona looked back toward Issei's breathless face. Haidu, you're coming back. Scene, Kuo Academy Hallway. Riaz was running once again, back from the old school building with a small red box in hand. 
Only feet from the student council room, the redeed noticed a large and blue flash. Shit, shit, shit. Don't you dare, Sona. Don't you fucking dare. Rias tried to run faster, but didn't seem to gain any more speed. Rushing through the doors, Rias could now see Sona taking her clothes off. Hearing the door slam, Sona turned her head back toward Rias. Sorry Rias, checkmate. Sona adjusted her glasses and then used both hands to unclasp her bra as she smirked ever so slightly. Rias looked over at Issa. He was breathing faintly, though his eyes were still closed. Rias stomped her foot down in anger. Well, let's have it, what piece did you use on him? Rias had her cheeks puffed out while her expression was that of pure grumpiness. Hans. Sona was now completely naked as she was slowly removing Issa's clothing. Rias nods with a scowl. A pawn then. No, eight to be precise, all eight pawns. As the violet-eyed Sona finished removing the final articles of clothing on Issa, she curled into the blood-soaked coach while she held his head to her chest. Eight. You used all eight of your pieces on him. Rias looked about ready to explode. His body wouldn't take anything less. Sona took a deep breath as she placed one of her hands over Issa's hair, softly caressing his head. Then that means he is, well, really strong. Wait hey. That's not fair. You have more peerage members than I do. Rias stomped her foot down once again. Keep it down, Rias. All is fair in love and war. Besides, you don't even know him. At least I can say that I've actually spent time with him. So it just makes more sense that I take him, doesn't it? Sona now closed her eyes while smiling warmly. This isn't over, Sona. Go ahead, do your skinship with a kid, but you haven't heard the last of this. I'm going to take a shower, all of that running made me sweat. ERRR. Rhea storms out of the student council office in a rage. Sona simply nods while continuing to keep her eyes closed. After a few minutes of peace and quiet, a small knock at the same door could be heard. President, I've brought refreshments and oh I see. Tsubaki nearly lost control of the serving tray she was carrying. Sona opens her eyes while looking toward Tsubaki. SHH, come in. I'd like to introduce you to your new teammate. Tsubaki walks in and shuts the door behind her. Afterwards, she places the tray down onto a coffee table. She then stands over Sona and Issei. All eight of my pawns, gone. Haidu is a greedy boy, don't you think? Sona softly giggled. So it's true then, his sacred gear must be legendary. Something so strong that it would require great power in order to awaken it. What do you think it is? Tsubaki adjusted her own pair of teal glasses. According to what I've read, there are a few possibilities, but I have my suspicions. Sona slowly closes her eyes once again. Sona lifts her leg, which was directly over Issei's gaping wound. Would you mind checking to see if his bleeding has stopped? Tsubaki does as ordered. Yes, it looks to be closing. I believe our koha is in the clear. I would suggest skinship for the rest of the evening though, just to be safe. To the HQ then. Sona opens one eye while smiling. Indeed, President. Tsubaki holds a glass of coconut water and takes a sip. Scene, four blocks from Kuo Academy, ten minutes later. Tsubaki and Sona were standing across the street from what looked to be some kind of coffee house. The large sign read, Alice's Tea Party Made Cafe. Tsubaki, who had unconscious Issei laying on her back, kept her grip on both of Issei's legs as she and Sona made their way across the street and into the cafe. Scene, Alice's Tea Party Made Cafe. Sona was relocking the main entrance while she took a deep breath. All right, everything is secured, let's get him downstairs and comfortable. The business in which the girls were taking a say through had a very Wonderland type of theme to it. The booths were all set in different and random colors as the walls showed different scenes of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Since none of the lights were turned on as the business was closed this late at night, other details of this place were obscured. As Sona, Tsubaki and an unconscious Issei made their way through the back of the kitchen area, a hidden door was opened by the violet-eyed student council president. It was cleverly placed in between a pair of large coffee grinders. Once the entranceway was revealed, the two girls made their way down the stone steps as they began their descent. Scene, 30 minutes prior, Kuo Academy. Okay, carefully, let's lower him in. Tsubaki was holding Issei's legs while looking toward Sona. Sona had hold of Issei's chest as she nodded toward Tsubaki. Yes, I have him. Panning out, we notice a large and tiled bathroom. Together, Tsubaki and Sona were both completely naked as they were standing in a very large bath. Holding on to Issei, the two girls softly lowered the unconscious teen into the steaming green bathwater. Once they were finished, both girls also sat back into the water. Remind me to thank you Udo Kibble later for lending us clothes for Haidu. Sona had both of her arms around Issei's chest, keeping his head afloat. Naturally. Also, President, I've sent Momo and Ria out on a mission. With this whole fallen angel incident, we can't be too careful. They said that the memory deletion of this Rainer creature should be finished by morning. Tsubaki leans back into the water and closes her eyes. Sona nods. 
Make sure they take extra care with social media and phones too. Last time they missed a few things. I've always told them it's better to be thorough than have to do it all over again. Tsubaki nods while her eyes remain closed. Yes president. Scene, basement of Alice's tea party, present time. Shall I get you anything before I retire for the evening, president? Tsubaki was standing next to a wooden door as she made a slight bow. Sona shook her head while showing a warm smile toward her queen. No, nothing. Great work today, Tsubaki. You are on top of everything. I am proud to have you in my family. Tsubaki showed a slight smile as she opened and then shut the door behind her. The room itself was windowless, though it was furnished in a curious manner. The theme was a pastel violet color with Victorian-style navy blue ribbons adoring the place. The picture and painting frames were also matching the color of the ribbons. Toward the center and back of the room was a large bed. Following the theme of the room, it was a turn-of-the-century canopy style with light purple curtains and a matching comforter. In said bed was both Sona and Issei, as she held him against her under the covers. Looking down at the sleeping teen, who had his head resting against her ample chest, Sona smiled warmly and began to comb through his hair with her fingers. Well, it looks like I get to have you all to myself, hi do. You're better for it. Frankly, I couldn't imagine another devil let alone another faction, digging their grubby little claws into you. Sona pulled Issei in even tighter, and she began to happily close her violet eyes. Scene, same place, early morning, A-H-H-H. Where are my clothes? SS, SS, Sona SH, SH, Shitori. Hearing all of the loud noise, Sona opens her violet eyes while seeing a blurry essay covering himself with a set of sheets. Taking a deep breath, Sona sat up and reached for her glasses. She then turned back to a very noticeably freaked out essay. Before Sona could get a word in, essay proceeds to look under the sheets and at his leg. Wait. Where is it? Was it all just a really bad dream? Issei then looks out from under the blankets to see Sona once again, this time she has a small smile. No, it couldn't have been, because you are here. Not quite trusting his own eyes, Issei did a double take on his leg just to be sure. Issei's almost comical actions made Sona begin to giggle slightly. Heh, no, Haidu, it wasn't a dream, though I am sorry you had to endure what you did. Sona's face reverted to its natural stoic features. You died last night. I wasn't fast enough. I didn't have any choice. Usually I would ask first but I didn't have time. Also, there was Rias. Sona placed a hand over her mouth while acting embarrassed. Rias? You mean Gremory Senpai. What does she have to do with anything? Also, what are you talking about, this asking thing? I don't understand what you meant by choice. Issei does a quick look around the bedroom he is in. And where are we? Calm down, Haidu. I will explain everything in due time. For now, how about a morning meal and then a nice talk? Sona adjusts her glasses while showing her slight smile once more. Yeah, um, alright. But seriously, where are my clothes? Issei tightened the sheet around his body while looking extremely embarrassed. After looking around the room for a moment, the teen's eyes fell back onto Sona, who was now getting out of bed. SSS, SSS, Sona, why are you naked? Wait, I'm naked, you're naked. Did you take my V-card? Issei's worried face began to slowly turn into a victorious grin as his nostrils began to flare out. Sona blushes immediately, while her expression turns into a mix of both frustration and embarrassment. Of course not, Baka. I was merely healing your wounded leg. Sona reached for the nearest object that was next to her, in this case a class textbook, and proceeded to toss it in Issei's direction. Scene, Alice's tea party made cafe, ten minutes later. Wow, this is amazing. You said that Tsubaki made this. Is she a five-star chef or something? Issei was scarfing down a large plate of food. Breakfast consisted of a Japanese-style omelette, sticky rice and miso soup. Sitting at the multicolored booth on the other side of Issei was both Sona and the now-blushing Tsubaki. The restaurant hadn't seemed to open yet as the place was practically abandoned. Sona, who was also eating, looked back over toward her flustered compatriot and smirked slightly. Damn, this really is great. Issei's smile was very warm and very alive. Sona was now smiling back at the teen, glad that he was indeed alive. Tsubaki is a very talented woman, Haidu. Feel free to rely on us from now on, alright. Issei stopped chewing his food and looked back at both girls. Each lady had a small and almost welcoming smile on their face. Smiling back at them, Issei nods. Well, alright. Also, this is going to sound strange, but everything feels weird today. Like, I think that monster lady did something to me. Sona and Tsubaki smirk and quickly revert their features into the stoic spectrum. How so, Haidu? Sona spoke in a quiet tone. My vision is acting funny, so is my hearing. Things seem brighter than normal, and dark places aren't dark anymore. As far as my ears, well, they are really sensitive. You think I'm coming down with a cold or something? Issei showed a slightly concerned look as he locked eyes with Sona. 
Smiling a bit, Sona replies in a soft voice. It has nothing to do with the fallen angel known as Rainer. Fallen angel, is that what she was? Well, fuck those guys. I thought angels are supposed to be the good guys. Issei tilted his head. So, if it wasn't this angel thing, what could my problem be? It's not that you have a problem, Haidu, it's that you are adjusting to your new body. Sona spoke in a matter-of-fact sort of way. New body? Okay, this is getting weird. What are you talking about Uluo? Issei stood up from his booth bench as he pointed excitedly toward Sona and Tsubaki, who both extended their devil wings. As both girls smile casually and sip their morning tea, Issei continues to point while smiling nervously. At wings. Issei looks back at Sona questioningly. Shaking her head, Sona replies. Not quite, think devil. Haidu, these are devil wings. The same wings that you now have as well. Issei sat back down in a woozy manner. Devil. Issei was just staring at his plate with an expression of indifference. So, I'm one of those things my childhood friend used to speak ill of. Well, he was wrong about angels, so maybe he is just ignorant. Devils aren't evil, Issei. Just like humans, devils come in all shapes and sizes. Some are very good while others are not so good. Look at me, please. Sona has a very warm expression which looks to have surprised her queen, Tsubaki. Looking up from his plate and into Sona's eyes, Issei froze. She was so beautiful right now. How come she always comes off like this authoritarian? I remember my first day at the academy and the first time I saw her. At first, I couldn't help how cute I thought she was, only for her to be on my ass like white on rice. Seemed like she really enjoyed going after me, Mitsuda and Motohama whenever we were doing our daily inspection of the kendo girls locker rooms too bad I never got to see anything, those assholes, always making me the lookout. Also, why did she always find out if I had missing homework and then force me to do it, under her scrutiny? Well, maybe I was wrong about her. It's true, her boobs aren't the largest, but damn petite chicks are hot. Haha, <laughs> boobs, Sona's boobs, they're nice and firm looking I wanna suck on them. Issei? Issei? Why are you drooling? Hello? Sona was waving her hand in front of Issei's glazed over expression as the teen continued to smile pervertedly. Hearing his name over and over again, Issei broke out from his own fantasy and noticed Sona's hand waving back and forth in front of his face. Oh, yeah sorry, I was um, just thinking about things and um, stuff. Issei's smile turned into a nervous one. Sona raises an eyebrow and then nods. It's completely understandable, considering a life-changing event has recently happened to you. But I just want to reinforce the fact that everything is going to be just fine, I'll see to it myself. Issei nods with a bit of suspicion behind his smile. President, can I ask you a question? Sona nods. I was just curious. Why were you and Grimory Senpai following me last night? Issei waited for a reply while trying not to come off as suspicious. Sona's eyes widened suddenly. Ah yes, naturally you would want to know such information. It was because of your sacred gear. It's something that a lot of other people will either want or fear. Sacred gear? Sounds like something from a badly written manga. Issei shrugs. So, what is it then? After having spent enough time with you as my new servant, I have deduced that you are this generation's security no coat. You carry within you the Red Dragon Emperor's Gauntlet, also known as the Boosted Gear. It's very special, Issei. Sona shows a slightly proud smile. Okay, well, it has a nice ring to it, though I have no idea as to what you are talking about. Also, what's up with this servant's stuff? Issei had a flustered expression. Seen, Kuo Academy, four hour later. Sitting on the same couch he died on, Issei was eating a bento prepared by Tsubaki. The couch itself, which was made of blue velvet material, no longer had any traces of the teen's recent demise as the blood stains were all but removed. Meanwhile the entirety of the student council were also enjoying their lunches, such as Tsubasa Yura and Tsubaki Shinra, who were both sitting on either side of Issei. Sona was sitting at her desk as usual, silently eating her meal as she was reading a book. Momo Hanakai, Ryaku Saka, Tomo Miguri, Tsubasa Yura and Ruruko Nomura were all sitting on the remaining furniture within the student council room. Some of them were simply eating their lunches, while others were multitasking with either homework or social media via their phones. Issei remembered a few key details from earlier that morning as he continued to eat in silence. It just seemed surreal. I'm a devil. Sona Shitori is actually Sona Sitri of some major house down in hell. No, she called it the underworld. Right, this is so weird. So that bitch, Yuma, kills me. Sona brings me back to life. She claims that I've got this thing called a sacred gear and it's supposed to be an awesome one too. Then she says that I am her servant. Well, at first, that didn't sit right with me, not at all. But after thinking about it, not only was she responsible for killing that black-winged bitch for me, but she also saved my life. Sona said that the servant thing is just a formality, and I am now more like her family. I think that's how she put it. Then there is Tsubaki. 
To be honest, I never really noticed her for being a pretty damned caring person. It seems like most of this morning, she would constantly ask as to how I was feeling. Maybe she's just being nice because I made a simp of myself when it came to her goddess-like cooking. But I wasn't exaggerating, it was really good. Oh, right, I almost forgot. Not only am I a devil within the house of Citri, but I'm also a member of the student council, just like all of the others in this room. I think Sona thought it would be funny to make me head of the morals committee. I mean, she doesn't smile that much, but I could swear she was after stating the fact. I'm not alone in this position as Tsubasa, Ria, and Tomo volunteered to help. But come on, I must say hi to. I was probably the number one suspect that these three would go after, that is until today. Mitsuda and Motohama, not to mention Aika, have all deemed me a traitor to the cause. All three of them confronted me in homeroom class as soon as Momo made an announcement on the intercom that I was now in the council as a fully-fledged member. Yeah, they aren't talking to me anymore. Well, fuck them. I'm still a say hi do, and I will become harem king. The say was drawn from his thoughts when he caught himself looking towards Sona, who was still reading her book and finishing her lunch. Then, behind Sona, through the window, Issei could see the old school building. He's seen it before and thought nothing of it, however flashing lights were seen from the upper level rooms. Tilting his head, Issei continues to watch. Sona notices Issei seemingly staring at her and slightly blushes. I do, if you take a picture, it will last longer. Sona stoically scoffs. Issei points his finger, again seemingly at Sona, while his expression begins to show a bit of concern. Um, President. Sona finally gets it and looks behind her. Standing outside of the windowed balcony on the top level of the old school building was Akeno Himajima, waving her arms out frantically. The moment the black-haired senpai noticed a few of the council members noticing her, Akeno waved her arms even more frantically, clearly trying to gain everyone's attention. Sona stands up. Something is wrong. Everyone, let's go. Sona makes her way to the main doorway. Everyone else in the room follows her lead. Scene, occult research club, old school building. Rias, 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 how many times do I need to tell you to behave yourself and just submit to Riser's overwhelming awesomeness? All I'm doing is showing you how much I appreciate that rockin' body of yours. The shorter blonde-haired man was currently sitting on a red velvet couch alongside Rias. He had his hands all over the red-headed senpai as she was trying to push him away. He was wearing what looked to be a maroon-colored leisure suit as his little hands continued to grope Rias' jiggly bits. Stop it, Riser. I said I am not interested in marrying you. No. Don't touch me there. Rias was very irate as she continued to push this strange little man off of her. Bursting through the front doors of this room was Sona along with her entire peerage, including the newest member, Issei Haidu. Seeing what was happening, Sona pointed toward the shorter blonde-haired man with a look of disgust. Get your hands off of my friend, Riser Phoenix. Scene, Orc, Old School Building. Mind your own business, you four-eyed bitch. The smaller blonde man screamed back toward Sona. Sona gritted her teeth as did Tsubaki. The rest of the Citri period showed slight defensive stances. Issei on the other hand was repeating what this riser prick had just called his new savior and friend. Issei's mindscape. Sona followed me during my entire date. Sona had Tsubaki save my life when Yuma was most definitely going to give me a slow and agonizing death. I could see the sadism in those fucked up pink eyes of hers. That smile, disgusting. Sona saved me. Sona resurrected me. Sona slept with me, naked. To me, she's a fucking goddess. Then he does this bullshit with Grimory Senpai. How dare this prick just sit there while fondling Grimory Senpai. She doesn't like that, Riser. Stop it. Stop touching her like that. Stop it. The large and red glow permeated the room momentarily. Boost. Once the light had diminished, Issei had vanished from his location, only to now be standing at the opposite side of the room, holding the smaller Riser against the wall by his maroon collar. His free arm was now adorned in a crimson-colored gauntlet that covered his entire arm ending in clawed hands. That same and clenched hand was also headed toward the face of a very shocked Riser Phoenix. As Riser's eyes widened at what was coming, time seemed to slow down. Even though it was only about 10 seconds worth of time, after he heard the red gauntlet declare boost for a second time, the short blonde man with a strange X-shaped mark on his face attempted to move but realized that this kid's strength was enduring while effortlessly holding him in place. It couldn't be helped, Riser was going to be struck. POW. Riser went through the drywall and into the other room, which looked to be a bathroom. Issei stood in place while holding out his arm, studying this new thing that was attached to his hand. It was a green jeweled and crimson gauntlet that covered his entire forearm and hand. His fingers were large claw-like appendages as he flexed them a few times. Before Issei could react, a large and yellow flame came bursting from the broken drywall and toward the teen. Deciding it was best to hit the floor, that's exactly what Issei did. However he caught a small part of the blast as it singed the back of his shirt while he collapsed downward and onto the carpet. 
Now Issei was rolling around the carpet while extinguishing his flames. Issei. Sona screamed out madly while producing a magical sphere of water. The sphere immediately shot at mock speed toward the teen, drenching him in the liquid. Issei then stood up while looking behind him, giving Sona a smile and a thumbs up. Thanks president, you're the best. Issei then winked. Sona blushed madly but did what she could to maintain her normal expression of professionalism. Turning around, Issei got back into his fighting stance, only to hear the scream of what sounded like a younger girl. Yeah. It's you. Issei turned around only to see a smaller and blonde-haired girl. Issei didn't notice her until now, so he turned all the way around to meet her gaze while looking confused. Did he know this girl? Well, she did look a bit familiar, but he couldn't be sure. Realizing that he could feel a draft on his upper back, Issei turned around only to see the back end of his shirt was now missing, exposing his scars. Not quite understanding what was going on, Issei was drawn out of that entire matter the moment he heard another female voice, making grunting sounds from the bathroom area, where Issei made a new door. Before Issei could ask, he heard the sounds of footsteps, crunching over broken drywall. Walking through the large cloud of dust was a very tall and very curvy woman. She had to be at least six feet with a few inches to spare. Her hair was long, messy and blonde. Her eyes were the color of midnight blue, while her lips, even though they were adding to the woman's scowl at the moment, were full and perfect. Issei then did a double take and noticed something very odd about this woman. Firstly, she seemed to be wearing the same clothes as the short round, riser. But it looked very small on her as her bare arms and legs stuck out from all ends. Her chest looked to be the biggest problem when it came to the clothes situation. Her chest was heaving from the buttoned-up shirt, though it was losing buttons, rapidly. The second and more curious aspect of this very beautiful and tall woman was her face. It had a similar X-shaped mark to it. Wait, wait, no, don't tell me you were that little douch bag. Issei started to back up slowly and toward Sona's group. He had a look of complete and utter shock. Shit, I hit a chick I, 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 I didn't know. The large and female version of Riser wiped the blood dripping from her lip while grinning. I know what that red gauntlet is. You're the red dragon emperor. I've been looking for my very own dragon. Sister. It's him. Look at his back. The smaller blonde devil was frantically trying to get the attention of her alleged older brother, no, make that, her older sister. Riser tilted her head and looked back at Issei while maintaining her grin. Turn around, shrimp. No way. Fuck off. Issei proceeded to flip off Riser using his gauntleted arm while smiling. Riser's grin intensifies. Alright, you like it rough, do you? Riser vanishes from her spot only to appear in front of Issei. Before the teen can react, he feels a sharp pain toward his gut as the wind is knocked out of him. Leaning over Riser's knee, the woman pulls back his shirt and her eyes widen. Sona then stomps on the ground as she has another blast of water prepared in a sphere. Release my pawn, right this instance, Riser Phoenix. Riser begins to softly trace her index finger around and over Issei's scars while smirking back toward Sona. And what if I don't? Citri, is it? Well, you just so happen to have something I have been wanting. But now, he has other value, right Ravel? The smaller blonde-haired girl nods enthusiastically. Yeah, yeah, just take it easy on him, okay? Riser's grin turns a bit softer toward her sister. It was just a love tap, he'll be fine. Release him, do it now. Sona's fear of water was now twice its original size, as Tsubaki also had her mirror Alice manifested as she stood beside her king. No, I think Riser will keep him. I like the look of his eyes. There is fire behind them. No, Riser has made up her mind, you will trade with me, Sona Citri. Riser then puts Issei into an arm lock. Once Issei was able to come to his senses, he found his face being halfway pushed into a very large and rather firm boob. Hey stop that. Hey, wait a minute oh oh, Op Issei was now showing his lecherous side, as serious expression had all but completely vanished, only to be replaced by a smile of perversion. Sona turned beat red as she looked absolutely furious. Hi do. Issei's eyes widened as the voice of Sona buried its way into his senses. Right. Now is not the time for boob appreciation. Let go of me, lady. Don't be like that, cutie, just stay put and be still, otherwise, I'll have to put you to sleep. Riser began to tighten her arm while grinning. Riser then turned her attention to Ravel. Do it. Ravel nods and tosses a marble-sized object toward the ground. Once it hits, a blinding flash of yellow light took over the room. Sona screamed frantically. Issei. Once the flash ended, the room was empty of Riser, Ravel and now, Issei. Sona looked around the room as did Tsubaki and the rest of the peerage. Ria's had a look of complete shock as did her peerage. Akeno had a hand over her mouth while Kiba and Kaneko both stared back at one another with blank looks. Ria's. Get a hold of your brother, right now. Sona pointed angrily toward Ria's. Ria's took a moment and then nodded. You got it. Akeno then took her hand away from her mouth and slowly spoke. Riser is a girl. 
Sona grinded her teeth. That doesn't matter right now. I want my pawn back. Scene, unknown location. Issei was thrown onto a large sofa. Not understanding what had just happened, the teen looked around desperately. This was another room that Issei was unfamiliar with. It looked to be a large and very fancy outer chamber with gold inlays surrounding the marble walls and floors. There were windows too, large ones, which showed a garden in the distance, however the sky was purple. Looking back in front of him, Riser and Ravel both stood while staring him down with blank looks. What gives? Issei folded his arms while looking a bit annoyed. Riser scoffed while Ravel placed an index finger toward her chin as she appeared to be thinking. Those scars on your back, they look like a pair of hands and knees. Tell me how you got them. As Issei was sitting on the maroon-colored sofa, Ravel was now crouching down and looking into Issei's eyes with a look of intrigue. Not that it's any of your business, but I got them doing something really stupid when I was a kid. Issei made his own scoff toward the end of his sentence. That last action made Riser smirk. Ravel, not feeling satisfied with Issei's answer, puffed her cheeks out in an entitled manner. Tell me what happened. Issei took a moment and noticed a seriousness behind this smaller girl's blue eyes. Taking a deep breath, Issei relents. I saved a child from a burning building. It was about to collapse and I heard this girl screaming. So, like an idiot, I ran into the place and carried her out on my back. I think she must have been partially on fire or something. But I don't remember what happened afterwards as I woke up in the hospital for smoke inhalation. So that's it, that's the story. Satisfied. Can I go home now? Ravel's eyes begin to water up. Riser notices this and places one of her hands on her sister's shoulder. They both had similar looks of melancholy. Hey now, what's wrong? Did I say something wrong? I have a tendency to do that. Issei had a look of concern now. Riser, without a smirk or a grin, looked back at Issei with a look of what could only be described as respect. You saved my sister's life, Red Dragon Emperor. Issei looks confused at first, only to jerk back suddenly as Ravel reached out and hugged him very hard. She had her crying face in his burned Kuo Academy dress shirt. At the same time, Issei felt his head being patted only to see a smiling riser looking back down at him. Okay, so I am now thoroughly confused. You kidnapped me because I saved your sister's life in a fire. Issei tilted his head. Oh no, darling. Riser pats Issei just a tad bit harder. That's just the icing on the cake scene, unknown location. You're here because I find you so much more valuable than some grimmery chick. Riser sat down beside Issei and placed an arm around Issei's shoulder. So, you're the Red Dragon Emperor of Domination, isn't that right? Ravel, who was still hugging the confused Issei Haidu, looked back up while using one of her hands to wipe away her straight tears. Ooh oh, so I was saved by a real-life dragon. Ravel started to show a bright smile. Issei looked firstly toward Riser, who was on the side of him. Seeing this very beautiful blonde woman, staring back at him with what could only be described as stars in her dark blue eyes, made the teen a bit nervous. Breaking eye contact, Issei turned his head toward the front of him while looking down. Seeing Ravel's equally blue eyes with hearts behind them made Issei just as uneasy as looking at her older sister. Drag, drag, dragon. I don't have the slightest clue as to what you're all talking about. Issei lifted his gauntleted arm while proceeding to shake it around frantically. And this thing, what the hell is this? It doesn't come off. Both Ravel and Riser looked back at one another, having puzzled expressions. Deciding that it was no use for now, Issei stopped his attempt at removing the gauntlet. Ravel then stood up while placing both of her hands on Issei's shoulders, while showing a bright smile. Don't worry, it's okay, stay here, I'll be right back. Ravel then dashed off into the dimly lit hallway. What? Alrighty then Issei lifted an eyebrow and then turned his attention back onto Riser, who still had her arm over his shoulder. Um, so can I ask you a question, er, Riser? Showing a smirk, Riser slowly nods. Are you really a chick? Issei looked rather serious while asking this question. Wanna find out? Riser winks while using her free arm to pull down her almost button-free button-up shirt, showing some of her extremely large and tan cleavage. Issei's eyes stare exactly where we think he's staring. Ugh those tiggle lay biddies look pretty real to me Issei's serious expression regressed into a drooling smile. Wanna know a secret, red dragon? Riser shows a carnivorous kind of smile. Riser is so powerful that I can condense it all into a smaller form. Considering that Riser looks more like a boy at that size, I thought it would be fun to pose as a male. I mean, why not? Riser loves the ladies, oh yes I do. Riser, just like I say, begins to show one of her own lecherous smiles. Clearly, you've got great taste, kid, looking at Riser the way you do. Issei shakes his head rapidly, attempting to break away from his internal fantasies. No, not now, stop it Issei. Riser lifts one of her golden eyebrows. Riser, ma'am, it's really cool that you can do all of that, erm, stuff with shrinking and cross-dressing and all that. Yeah, so, when can I go home? Issei was showing a very nervous expression. 
Bryzer's grin turned into a slight frown as her eyes hawkened into Issei's. Home? Issei, is it? Well, Issei, let me be perfectly plain. You are home. Riser tightened her arm around Issei's shoulder, while changing her expression back into her usual grin. Besides, you've just arrived. Riser hasn't had a chance to show you around the family mansion, as I said earlier, you're home. For now, you won't be going anywhere, Issei. Okay, this is weird. I'm calling it, you're crazy. Issei protested. Ha 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 ha. You amuse Riser. Crazy you say? Ha 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 ha. Dragon boy, you don't know what crazy is. Now calm down, shrimp. I didn't bring you here to hurt you. I told you before, didn't I? You saved my little sister's life. If anything, my family is indebted to you. Riser loosened her arm on Issei's shoulder. Indebted? Well, if that's true, then why am I here? Issei folded his arms in protest. Sekiruite kun. Ravel was dashing down the hallways and back into the antechamber, with a very bright smile on her face, as she was carrying a large and leather-bound book. Issei found himself brightening up a bit by the sound of Ravel's enthusiastic voice. He, Sakuranya, what? My name is Issei, Issei Haidu, Ravel Chan. Not able to help himself, the teen also found himself smiling warmly toward the shorter blonde girl, the same girl that should be covered in burns, considering the large- Oh, don't worry, I can explain everything with this. Ravel presented a large and leather-bound book. It had a large title written on the cover, however it was in a language that Issei couldn't read. Ravel sat back down on the other side of Issei while placing the book in his lap. She then turned to a specific section within the book. There were pictures, and Issei noticed a black and white drawing of his gauntlet. Looking at his arm at first, Issei turned his attention back onto the book. Riser was also staring at the book with great interest. Well, Mr. Haidu, my name is Ravel Phoenix, and I am a high-class devil. It's a pleasure to meet you, my hero. Ravel holds out her hand while blushing. As Riser tilts her head at the scene, Issei lifts an eyebrow while reaching out and simply shaking her hand. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yup, this has been fun, but I really should get going now. Issei attempted to stand up, however Riser's arm was still wrapped around the teen's shoulder, as the taller blonde tightened her hold, keeping the teen in place. What part of you aren't going anywhere don't you understand, Issei Haidu? Riser crossed her legs while pulling Issei's head into her shoulder. You're mine, dragon boy. Now forcefully laying against Riser's shoulder and neck, Issei couldn't do much aside from listen to Ravel read from this strange book. Don't worry, Issei, can I call you Issei? Well, Issei, this book is an heirloom that's been in my family for generations. It's called Grimoire de Draconis. I've read through it several times because unlike my sister, I am the smart one. Ravel snickered a bit. Shut up, brat. Want me to stuff you in the dumbwitter again? Riser was showing an embarrassed grin. Calm down, sis, learn to take a joke. Ravel clears her throat. Ahem, as I was saying. So, Issei Kun, tell me, how long have you been a devil? Issei, still laying against Riser, lifts his head as the woman releases her hold. I don't know, maybe 24 hours. It's hard to remember, I sort of died and all. Issei adjusts his sore neck. Ravel looks back at Riser, and the two show small frowns. Issei notices the silence and can't help but nervously giggle. Riser stares back toward Issei with hawkish features. How? Issei shrugs his shoulders while making a small frown of his own. Some bitch, pretending to be my girlfriend, she ended up killing me. Turns out she is this thing called a fallen angel. Don't worry though, Sona's queen, Tsubaki, got revenge for me. Ding dong, the bitch is dead. Scratching the back of his head in a nervous manner, Issei notices both girls aren't smiling or laughing at his story. Issei? Ravel spoke softly. Sup? Issei lifted an eyebrow. Are you okay? Ravel tilts her head while showing a look of deep concern. Um, sure, why wouldn't I be? Issei found himself scratching the back of his head nervously once more. Riser grunts. Bullshit. You said you were dating this girl, right? Then she does what? Kills you. If you were going out with her, that suggests that you liked her. Heh, trying to act tough, shrimp. Issei grinds his teeth and stares down a surprised-looking Riser. Call me shrimp again. Riser tilts her head while grinning like a maniac. SHR. Shut up. Sister, stop being a baka. Ahem, back to the book. Ravel begins to read in a very loud voice. Issei, you have the gauntlet of the Red Dragon Emperor, yes son already told me. Issei folds his arms again. Well, previous generations of the Sekiruite have done great things. I bet you didn't know that. Also, you get to do this thing called a balance breaker. Ravel turns a page showing a strange figure in some kind of armor. I bet you didn't know that either. The smaller Phoenix era smiles victoriously. Issei takes hold of the book and brings it closer to his eyes as he squints. Okay, okay, you're right, Ravel-chan. Issei was impressed by this hand-drawn picture involving a draconic suit of armor. 
It reminded him of something from one of his favorite anime action flicks. Bravel's smile somehow gets even wider as she nods in satisfaction. Naturally. Be thankful for my amazingness. After all, I am a phoenix. My pedigree is top-notch, and my bloodline is practically that of royalty. While staring at the drawing of this new version of what his gear could look like, Issei found himself absentmindedly patting Ravel on her head. Aha, uh -huh, that you most certainly are. Ravel was about to protest as her face began to show a grumpy expression, however she found herself enjoying the praise and began to smile while closing her eyes. Yeah, ah, uh, that's ah, uh, that's right. Don't stop doing that, please. Ravel began to drool just a bit from the corner of her mouth as she looked to be in absolute bliss. Issei, still not paying attention, continued to nod while turning the page. Then his jaw dropped. A large and opposing dragon took over two entire pages. He looked amazing, Issei thought. Though this picture was only black and white, Issei could imagine this gigantic and red dragon flying through the air like something from a fantasy movie. Ravel, are you able to read this writing? I mean, the pictures are cool and all, but... Riser Phoenix. Ravel Phoenix. What's this I hear about you two, allegedly kidnapping Seraphal Leviathan's little sister's pawn? A tall and very beautiful young woman was standing at the entrance way suddenly. She had two pairs of long and drill-like golden hair, which almost touched the ground. She looked like an amalgamation of Riser and Ravel, all put into one woman. Riser stood up immediately as did Ravel. Issei decided that standing might be best, so he did the same while placing the book on the coffee table in front of him. Mother, I can explain. Riser was smiling nervously this time. The same out the word, mother, while looking at both girls and then back onto Mrs. Phoenix. I was expecting Rhea's Grimory to be cuddling with you on that Levesiate, however to my surprise, I see you there, doting over some mere human turned devil boy. How atrocious. The mother of both Phoenix sisters looked absolutely cross. Ravel squealed as her eyes began to water up. Eek, mother. But he is the one that. Ravel was cut off when Lady Phoenix stomped her high-heeled shoe onto the marble floor, making a loud and reverberating sound. Enough. I won't hear of this. You two have gone too far this time. Serzichs. Serzichs himself called me to complain about your behavior toward his little sister, Riser. Ravel thought hard and then looked toward Issei. Tugging on his shirt, Issei looked down at the little Phoenix heiress as Lady Phoenix continued to reprimand a cowering Riser. Hey, can you please turn around? Please. Ravel showed a look of desperation, and Issei understood what she wanted. Nodding, Issei turned around, showing his back. Ravel then pointed toward the scars while clearing her throat loudly. Ahem. Mother. Look, it's him. Ravel was now pointing with both of her hands toward the bare back of Issei. Lady Phoenix widened her eyes in shock. Slowly approaching, the mother of the Phoenix sisters continued to quietly stare as she was able to get a better look at what her daughter was so eager to point out. Now standing directly behind Issei, Lady Phoenix took one of her hands and traced the small hand-marked shaped burns with her index finger. Turn around, please. Lady Phoenix said in a quiet voice. Issei slowly did as he was asked. Now facing the woman, Issei couldn't help but be impressed. She indeed had a presence of royalty. It wasn't just the gold and inexpensive dress she was wearing, it was also in her tone and mannerisms. What is your name, Pawn of Citri? Lady Phoenix's angry expression was now one of softness and courtesy. Oh, um, my name is Issei Haidu, her um, ma'am. Or do I call you your highness? He. Issei was extremely nervous as this beautiful blonde woman was only an inch away from his face. Lady Phoenix is fine, darling. Well, you look a little worse for wear, my clumsy older daughter didn't rough you up too much now, did she? Lady Phoenix was now giving Riser the evil eye. No, ma'am, it's fine. But now that you're here, Mrs. Lady Phoenix, maybe I might go home now. Issei smiled nervously. Meanwhile, both Riser and Ravel shook their heads no. Yes, I think you may be right, Mr. Haidu. Thank you for saving my daughter's life, and I would love to speak with you again in the near future, but you're right, taking you against your will is just so rude and childish. Lady Phoenix was nodding to herself. Say immediately calmed down. This woman was clearly a woman of reason. The teen felt that he should have known better. After all, this was a high-class devil and more so, a responsible adult. Issei began to smile brightly. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lady Phoenix. Issei made a short bow. Don't mention it, dearest. Lady Phoenix was now looking back at Riser with another cold stare. Take him home, then come back immediately. You and your sister are grounded. Ravel was about to cry, but then remembered the book that was on the coffee table. Mommy. Issei is the Sekiruite. Instantly, Lady Phoenix turned her attention back onto Issei and finally noticed his gauntlet. Is that... Ravel reached for the book and presented it to her mother, with a page showing the sacred gear drawing. See, it's true. Issei rubs the back of his head with his gauntlet arm while smiling nervously. Yeah, cool right. 
so, whenever we're ready to get going, I'm totally down. Riser began to smirk as did Ravel, oddly enough. Meanwhile, Lady Phoenix was staring Issei down with an unreadable expression. Um, Mrs. Lady Phoenix. Is there something on my face? Issei's nervous smile slowly turned into a look of worry as the lady of the house began to show a smirk of her own. End of the here. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.